Happy New Year, everybody. As you can see, I'm celebrating by putting up balloons and holding my gamma scale to them. But what exactly happened here? So I rubbed the balloon to give it a negative charge with a bit of wool. And uh, yeah, you can see it has quite a strong charge. It's able to attract a piece of paper. So I put up this balloon outside for one hour, then I popped it, put it into a bag, and uh, it was ready to be measured. I'm going to use my large Geigenmüller pancake detector here. Uh, first of all, let's get a background reading. You can see it fluctuates somewhat between 50 and 120 or something. So let's note this background reading, 50 to 120 counts per minute. And now let's measure this balloon I had put up for the early evening of New Year's Eve. Well, that is, statistically speaking, much higher than background radiation. Definitely. So, uh, what is this actually? Radioactive New Year or something? Let's, let's measure again at midnight. Here is a fresh balloon that I put outside for one hour again. Just this time around midnight when the fireworks were launched. Hmm, well. We can see this is still significantly above background, I suppose, but less than it was before, so can't be the fireworks, right? So it's time to chuck these balloons into the germanium detector and see what the gamma spectrum says about that. Hmm. Well, not much, but let's give it some time. So this is the spectrum of that balloon I had put outside uh, in the afternoon that was quite radioactive, about three times background radiation. And, uh, well, what you can see overlaying there in, in green is the actual background radiation. Uh, so, without the balloon in place, uh, both of these spectra were taken for a duration of 6.5 hours, approximately. Uh, well, you can see there's not really a difference between them, so there's no difference between background radiation and the actual spectrum, and the balloon is not measurably radioactive anymore either. And, well, as you probably expected, the same goes for the spectrum I took of the balloon that uh, I measured around midnight, which was less radioactive to begin with, but uh, now, except for some natural fluctuations, there's nothing special in there, it's pretty much background radiation. So, whatever is in there in terms of radioactive must be decaying quite fast. So, uh, let's redo the experiment with a new balloon and put it into the gamma spectrometer immediately. Alright, well, so we can see peaks rising after just a few seconds there, and if we look at the final spectrum after just 20 minutes, you can see these huge peaks arising from the spectrum. The channels you can see on the horizontal line correspond to the gamma energies, which are characteristic for the different radioisotopes. And on the y-axis, on the left, you can actually see how many impulses are in each bin that corresponds to that gamma energy. So how many of these types of gamma rays actually arrive within a given time. Now, if we look at the spectrum again after waiting a few minutes and then measuring for the same time, 1200 seconds or 20 minutes, you can see that there's much less of these impulses in, in each bin. So these peaks are much lower than they used to be in the previous spectrum. And that's because, well, these radionuclides seem to have a very short half-life. But well, what is actually giving off all these gamma rays? If we take a closer look and actually mark the corresponding lines that belong to the same nucleides, that basically belong to the same fingerprint, we can see two major isotopes, that is lead-214 and bismuth-214. And guess what? These radioisotopes are natural. The lines you can see here are from natural radioisotopes down the uranium-238 series decay chain. They, emitted, they are emitted from radon, a radioactive gas, which escapes the host rock where the uranium is bond and then readily travels into air and eventually decays into all kinds of different radioisotopes. Among some of them are these radioisotopes, lead and bismuth, which we can see because they have quite long half-lives within the minutes range, and they also have these gamma ray emissions, which not every of these nucleates have, so we can see them here. But in theory, fireworks could be radioactive, especially the green stuff because uh, the green color actually comes from barium, a uh, non-radioactive element, which is mined from barite minerals. But um, this barite may actually contain radium as well, and radium is radioactive. And due to the chemical similarity, both elements, the non-radioactive barium, as well as the always radioactive radium, are in the same group in the periodic table. They're both alkaline earth metals, so they're very hard to separate if you happen to have a mineral called radiobarite instead of your conventional barite. 
and radiobarite partly contains radium instead of barium. And this mineral, radiobarite, is actually the most radioactive mineral in the world. The hottest pieces may have up to 30 gigabicarel per kilogram. So in a kilogram of that mineral, 30 billion atoms are decaying every single second. That's really, really, really radioactive for a naturally occurring radioactive material. So yeah, in theory, this little green rocket here could be radioactive with quite a bit of radium. But, well, guess what? I didn't really find anything amongst those rockets I tested. Doesn't mean that it doesn't happen, that um, radioactive rockets don't happen, just I didn't have to happen any that were from made from uh, radio barite ore, apparently. But yeah, I didn't just have that rocket or a few rockets, but I actually had the dust that I had collected on my balloon during New Year's Eve, during midnight, when uh, about one million of these green rockets were launched within my city. But I didn't just detect no radium and uh, not an increased amount of radiation, but instead I even measured a decreased amount of radiation. So how can that be explained? The radon washout, which is a natural phenomenon, the naturally radioactive isotopes that are present there, should stay just about the same for a few hours, right? Well, I believe the most important factor is that, you know how the air is really thick with smoke and dust and everything, apparently non-radioactive dust, but there's still dust everywhere. So why wouldn't these little ions actually attach to that dust and fall to the ground because they're quite heavy instead of being attracted to my balloon? So I believe that's what happened, but, well, the conclusion is that the dust that is in the air in, on New Year's Eve is not that bad in terms of radioactive material. Um, there's no significant amount of radium being spread in that dust that you're breathing on New Year's Eve. At least not compared to the radon and decay products of radon you're breathing every single second. If you were to put your arms out and make a cube, you would be hugging approximately one cubic meter of air. Now imagine how many radioactive, naturally radioactive radon atoms are decaying in that cubic meter every single second. Well, the normal radon levels are about 50 to 200 bicarol. That means 50 to 200 decays of naturally occurring radioactive gas in every cubic meter of air in every single second. Now take a deep breath, inhale all that radon, and believe me, New Year is not going to change a thing, it's not going to give you cancer or anything. At least not in terms of radioactive material present within the air. I don't know about all that black powder, I don't know about all these chemicals being blown into the air, but radiation-wise, it seems pretty safe to me. Thanks for watching. And if you want to do this at home, feel free to do so. You just need a balloon and a piece of wool, then rub the balloon with the wool and put it up somewhere so it doesn't touch anything and discharge itself, and then measure it after a while. Uh, 10 minutes or one hour. If you have a sensitive uh, pancake Gallia Muller counter, that will definitely work. Uh, wiping down your old TV set, if you have uh, like these big tube TVs, that works as well because it has a, a, a charge in the front. So if it's been running for a while, you can swipe that down. Or uh, especially on a rainy day when the radon has been washed out, similar to how the, the, the dust actually washes out the radon from the air, uh, you can just swipe down your car and then measure that. You, you might actually find even cooler stuff on your car. So here's a little special thing for you. So this is a swipe from a car when it has been raining. Quite dirty car actually. You can see all these ni nice little peaks from uh, potassium 40 and these uh, radon daughters that we talked about before as they were washed out during the rain. But um, if you wait for a while until the shorter lived radioisotopes have decayed and the longer lived ones are actually visible, you will be able to see a beautiful peak coming up there if you're just lucky about the weather and everything. Nice. Beryllium 7. And why is Beryllium 7 special? Well, it is created by cosmic rays striking our atmosphere and destroying little nitrogen and oxygen atoms. So uh, these high energy cosmic rays strike those atoms and pretty much split them, like uh, splitting atoms occurs in a nuclear reactor. And thus, the fission product will be beryllium-7. So radioactive beryllium is created in our atmosphere and then is uh, washed down by the weather phenomena, you know, wind and high clouds and everything, and how that happens. And then it ends up, well, on the floor or on your car or whatever for you to measure. That's quite a beautiful thing, isn't it? It was given to you by the hostile environment of radiation from space.